Can I just say there, right here and now, Jimmy, you're a pain in my ass sometimes, but I love you. <laughs> Oh, you sing these maiden songs. I mean, now you've been singing them for God knows how long, right? Yeah, before Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing these songs. I mean, do you feel like you know you could you could still you still love the songs when you play them, or is there? Yeah, they're, cla they're classic songs. Are fantastic, obviously. I mean, and plus, we you know we've made the made history. You know, nobody sounded like us. And it's great, and, and it's it's good to do the honour because I, you know, Maiden aren't doing them ones, you know what I mean? And uh, so you get the best of both, you know, Maiden fans. They get me me fucking the songs up and Maiden doing a good job. <laughs> Live on the metal boys, celebrating the life of Paul Diano and, of course, Iron Maiden killers. We are dressed for the occasion. I got my <laughs> my shirt, I got my album, and I have somewhere my CD. And I have a cassette of it somewhere. I don't know where. Look, see? The whole family's here. There we go. We have Melissa, me all the way in Boston. We have Milwaukee Tom, of course, in Milwaukee. And of course, Stefan Giroux, maybe, I don't know, 20 minutes away from me. <laughs> <laughs> On the show today, we're going to talk about Killers. Go through the whole album, song by song. And then we're going to talk about the Killers tour that each one of you has attended in different cities in 1981. Old people. <laughs> yes. All right, let's begin. Um, the good news about being old. Yes, of course. All right, here we go. All Killer or a little bit of filler. Killers is the second studio album recorded by Iron Maiden, released on February the 16th, 1981. Released in May in the United States and Canada. Produced by Martin Birch. Dennis Stratton is out. Adrian Smith is in. Is it all killer? Is there a little bit of filler? Or is there a lot of filler? A lot of these songs came from years ago when the band was sort of jamming them out, playing with them in the clubs. But when it came time to record with Martin Birch, they created this monster. Let's start off with the Ides of March, an instrumental that goes all the way back to 1977 when Thunderstick had a similar song. He put it on the Samson album, Iron Maiden had Ides of March. Clyde said, what the hell's going on here? Big kerfuffle with EMI. Steve Harris gets a credit for the Samson version, but Thunderstick does not get a credit. Start off with Melissa. Ladies go first. What do you think oh, of the Ides of March? So I love this song. I think it's a great opener. I think it's a nice set piece to get the album going. I think it is a fully realized song. It's kind of like Eruption. It's one of those, is it an opener? Uh, to Wrath Child, or is it a fully realized song? Because it's only like a minute and a half, a minute and 40. I think it's a really, uh, an actual realized song. And I love this song. I think it, it just opens up, it just gets you ready for the rest, for the whole album, you know? It gets you going. It, it's set, and it goes, it slides in really nicely to Wrath Child. Just kind of slips right in. Stefan Giroux, very similar to The Hellion of Judas Priest, perhaps, an electric eye, but go ahead. Yeah, that was a comparison I was about to make. Uh, when the album came out, uh, I, I guess Killers uh, was had to be probably my first very heavy metal underground record. The heaviest thing I'd ever listened to before that was ACDC. So when Killers came out, and I put this thing, I was going to a record store, Rock Off Stock back then, that was playing it all the time. So it says, hmm, maybe I should get a copy. And when you drop the needle and you get this boom, 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 it was like mind boggling. Oh my God, this is unlike anything I've ever heard. And it was dueling guitars and, and, and Clive Burr's uh, rolling drums. I, I just thought, Oh my God, if this is the opening track, I can't wait to hear the rest. So for me, best album opening that year for sure. I mean, it was marvelous. 
And it only sort of opened my eyes and ears to what else was coming for the rest of the record. It's the assassination of Julius Caesar, which happened on March the 15th, I guess. Uh, Tom, what do you think? It's a seamless intro. It's not too long. It's not too short. It's the perfect amount of time and it sets the mood for the next track. All right, guys, let's get into the second track. Um, Rothschild. Melissa, what'd you think the first time you heard the song Rothschild? Off? I love this song. And I think, and I have to say something about, about like a song like Rothschild where mm -hmm. we know that uh, Bruce has done this song and Bruce can sing anything and we know he's a great singer or whatever, but it's not the same because Paul has the vibe. He has the Rothschild vibe. He has the whole gritty, uh, you feel like he's the Rothschild. He's not like a character that somebody's singing about. He's telling you about himself because he's got that whole, his whole persona just is very street level and very, um, you know, it's very different than, than obviously it's very different than, than Bruce's. But I love, I love this gritty song and, and he holds a note. He proves that he can actually sing for the people who go, ah, but he doesn't really sing. He does. He can really sing and he can really hold a note. Song is the second version, actually, Metal for Mothas was released in 1979. This is the remake version of Rothschild. It goes back way in time. It was actually, when I, Thunderstick showed me his uh, original sort of reel to reel, he wrote it as Rothschild, not Rathchild. So, which, you know, I'm a Rothschild, I'm a Rothschild, I'm a Rothschild. Are they talking about the family, the Rothschilds? I don't know. But Stefan Giroux, go ahead. I I um I was very impressed with that song because there was so much anger in it. It's anger. It's an angry song. Yeah, it is. And as much as I love and as much as I was okay with Bruce singing it, exactly. Bruce was never as angry as Paul was on stage. Paul, as you recall, was, you know, uh, widely influenced by punk rock. And this is that song on the album where Maiden, probably one of their last punk rock song until they evolve into the band we know now. And it had so much mm, anger. Like, you wanted to sort of, like, start slam dancing that's how we called moshing back then and uh it's pure metal angry metal not this 4-4 riff that acdc as you recall the hottest metal band at the time was doing it was different and and that is why for me it's always a very important song in the maiden catalog you know it's interesting because it has a groove too and it was never a big single, but it was a fan favorite. It never hit the charts as this big run to the hills, right? But man, it's been a fan favorite. How many times has a band played this song or Paul Diano has played this song? It's gritty and it's nasty. And I don't even think the word Rothschild is actually a real world, real word until Iron Maiden sort of coined it. I talked to the band Rothschild and they claimed they coined the term but I don't think so. I think uh, 1976 or 77 is when this song actually was created or written. And I think it was Maiden actually coined the term. There is no such word as Rothschild until Maiden came along with it. Yes, this is, but, you got Ides of March bleeding right into Rothschild. You couldn't ask for a better two song punch. And, and what's interesting is that, you know, very often we talk about, you know, the uh, how hard it is for bands to follow up a debut album because you spend your formative years, you know, forming, composing, and and perfecting the songs that make up your first album. And then you have to do a second one right after and like, oops, we're out of inspiration already. And made it didn't have that problem because they had a bulk of songs yes. yeah, that yeah. they could stretch. And a rat child was one of them. And it's very, very consistent with what they were doing at the time. And I have no, I didn't know that it dated back to 77. And when I found out and I found some very early maiden bootlegs, I said, yeah, I see how 
uh, Steve sort of shaped it with time and perfected it to to what it is now and what has been for 40, 43 years. A lot of people don't know this, but when they're recording killers or preparing to record for it, they were, it was just going. They had to go. One album out, we've got to get another one out as well. Fast, fast, fast. Grab everything we have. Put all the material That's together. how you did it back in the day. That's right. And Dennis Stratton was part of that process, the pre-production, and then they let him go, right? So he helped sort of uh, with the guitar harmonies. He helped with the the maiden sound back then, I guess. Um, Melissa, Murders in the Room Org. Love Murders in the Room Org. It's another song that um, that is believable when Paul is singing it and and more uh, storytelling when, when uh, Bruce is singing it. You kind of really feel like, Paul's telling you what's going on with him that he's the one in this situation. It's a it's the fast I think it's one of the fastest songs on the album and it's just it's just a banger. I mean, and it's and it's 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 like Wrathchild in that it's it's a it's a song that's much beloved that everybody wants to see live and everybody always enjoys and and we'll see what happens next year with what they what they do with their set list if they if they put it put it on. Uh but it's a great song. And yeah, and you know, yeah. they're they you're right you're right Stefan about they had no sophomore slump because they did have so many songs that they were able to fall back on they weren't in a situation where they were kind of caught with their pants down like oh my god we have to do the second album we have no material we only had six songs for the first album or whatever they they you know Steve is a planner and he 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 had stuff planned so he was already thinking about his second album and his third and his fourth. And his fourth. And this, this was one of the newer tracks. We'll call it newer. It didn't date back to 1976 or 77. This was one of the newer songs, but go ahead, Stefan. I uh, I felt that after the one-two punch of Eyes of March, Rothschild, Murders in a Room Morgue fit right in. I'm just take it down. Just listen to this slow intro. Doom, do, 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 do. And then it builds into this complete cavalry sounding song where you know you really feel like a murderer uh in a Edgar Allan Poe mo- uh, novel and what's interesting excuse the anecdote but night you know it came out at a time when I was struggling to learn English French being my mother tongue and I didn't know about authors, literature back then. So I went to the local library and looked up Edgar Allan Poe. I wanted to know what it was. And I took out the book from the library. There you go, learning with Maiden. <laughs> and, you know, I, it was a tough read. It's not the yeah, writing. I, I wouldn't even read it in my speaking. I was just going to say, uh, it's, it's a tough read in English, too. <laughs> It's a tough give read. Me the, give me the Archies. Go ahead. And, and then it made me realize that, A, uh, with good lyrics, you actually educate yourself. Iron Maiden is a smart band because they forced me to, you know, uh, sing about other stuff than, you know, big tits, pussy, and all that stuff. <laughs> and they could write songs that intelligent people could understand. And it, it creates those imageries in your mind, you know, where you think you're watching a movie, except instead of having a Hollywood orchestra, you have a heavy metal band as a soundtrack. And and it it's interesting for me because that's when I discovered that Iron Maiden would be my band because they knew how to work, how to write lyrics. Or at least got, lyrics yeah. And you know what's amazing about the song? I, like when I first heard it with Paul singing it, you just can't make out what he's really saying, right? But later on, as you learn the lyrics of what he's saying, there's a twist at the end, right? Yep. The whole the whole story is about, oh my God, there's there's a lady dead in front of me, or and then all the people are saying, Hey, you're you're the murderer, and he runs away from the scene of the crime, only to realize his doctor said he's done this before. So that's the twist. That's the storytelling and with the twist at the end. So that's what makes the song brilliant. Not only is it musically brilliant, not only is it the delivery, the vocal delivery brilliant, but man, oh man, the lyrics, just a nice little twist at the end. 
All right, guys. Another life. Melissa, this song uh, goes back all the way to 1977. Again, another of the old songs that they sort of scooped up and reimaged. But go ahead. This is a groovy song on the album, right? It's got a groove. It's got kind of a swing to it. Yeah. Um, a lot of people don't, I was talking to a lot of people who don't like this song and I don't know why I really like this song. I think it's catchy. I think it's groovy. I think it's got a nice swing to it. I think the drums sound great. I don't, I don't know why some people don't like this song, but I love the song. I, I, uh, I don't know why people don't like it. It's on par with the rest. It's extremely powerful Again, the lyrics on this one are a bit okay, not as cerebral, a bit more fluffy, but the musical line, the melody throughout the song. I mean, you can tell Iron Maiden always in the early days probably had a record company that told them, Go as heavy as you want, but if you could have one sensible song that could go on radio, no, okay. And so you could tell that they always tried. But Another Life be one of them? I don't think so. But it's one of those tracks that fits perfectly, especially on side one. Uh, remember, you've already listened to three highly powerful, potent songs in a row. And Another Life takes you, you know, in a different groove, like Melissa says. And it fits perfectly into, into this First of all, I like. I want to say this. Killers is my favorite Iron Maiden album. But Another Life is definitely a filler track for me because the lyrics are repetitive. Not to say I don't enjoy the song like I enjoy Gangland or Total Eclipse, but it falls into that category for me. If there's any song on this album that's sort of eh, not so great, this would be it. Because the lyrics, read the lyrics. He just repeats the same. It's like... Steve, Steve, do we have anything else? No, no, same old, re keep reading the same stuff, keep reading the same stuff, but I will keep it on. I will not skip that track. I still enjoy listening to it, and it is heavy. It is a The music is great. I mean, the even if, great. I mean, in some songs, if you don't even like the lyrics or whatever, but the music, you know, is, is worth the price of admission, you know? Absolutely. All right, folks, we're getting into the second instrumental, Ganga Skang. Melissa? I love this song. Now, I don't know if you guys have ever noticed this or not, but there's that passage. It comes about two minutes in um, that you will hear later on in Hallowed. Uh, listen, and you'll see. So it's you kind of like, oh, this is kind of the beginnings. Yes. Of of Hallowed, um, but it's a it's a great song. I mean, it's that's a it's a fun song, and and uh, you know, obviously it's a it's an instrumental, so there's no Paul singing, but um, it's a great song, and it's yeah. catchy. And you can bop to it and and uh, hum along to it and maybe make up your own words to it. I don't I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it, it to me whenever I play it, I, I think it was it was it was named properly because it sounds like you're going to battle. Yeah, it, it sounds yeah. like a battle. Everyone's you know get, get your bows and arrows and your axes. Get on your horse. Get, get on yeah. your horse. Let's go. Go ahead, Stefan. Genghis Khan. Look, it's a great track. It's well into the uh, to the album. But it is not the instrumental that Transylvania was. Notch below. Transylvania right. was a better life track. Genghis Khan, had they worked harder, they could have put a set of lyrics on it, I think. Uh, I do understand the concept of wanting to put uh, uh, instrumentals because they want to show how, you know, their dexterity, their musicianship, and put the focus on that uh, with a major, major groove. But I do think that it's one of those tracks that I'm not saying I press skip, but I don't always. It's it's your another life. That's what it is. <laughs> could be, could be, could be. I mean, right. I'm not a purist. I've been known to skip songs if I'm not in the mood to hear them. Innocent Exile, uh, here again, this is a track, goes back in the day, 1977. In a way, when you listen to Innocent Exile, it's kind of like a part two of Murders in the Room. I was just going to say that. It's another song about um, him but, getting in trouble with the law again. <laughs> but, you know, he, you know, 
the doctor, you know, again, framed for killing a woman, you know, uh, you know, that's what it's about, right? He's it's yeah. an innocent exile. Yeah. But the reality is this song was actually written before Murders in the Rue Morgues, but maybe Steve had that in mind, you know, a prequel, Murders in the Rue Morgue. Melissa? I was just going to say the same thing, that I thought that this was the um, sort of like the, the sequel to uh, Murders in the Rue Morgue. Yeah. Because that's, that's, that's what it sounds like to me. Yeah. Do you like the song in general? I, oh, yeah. I, spoiler alert. I, I like every song on this album. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know what's amazing about this song? If you listen to Yes and you listen to Chris Squire's bass, it's sort of like a lead instrument. It's a big treble. It's leading. Yes. It's the riff. The riff is the bass line. And everybody yeah, very much so in the, yeah, line. very much so in the song, yeah. 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 I mean, the, you know, Steve's a bass player, so his bass is front and center in most every Maiden song, right? I mean, he's not hanging around in the back; he's front and center. But yeah, yeah. you can definitely, um, you're right. You can definitely um, the bass is very much forward in the song. Yeah, yeah. It, it it actually leads the whole song, and and sort of if you listen to the bass to the guitar work, it's got a groove as well, and it's a big metal, bass-heavy song. Go ahead, yeah. Stefan. I, I feel the same thing. And, you know, the production of Killers was considerably more advanced than the debut album, uh, thanks to Martin Birch. And I felt, uh, listening to Innocent Exile, that he was going deep, like he said, and putting the bass really, really up front, uh, putting a dueling guitar in the correct speakers. That's right. And, and and mind you, I still prefer the Made in Japan version, but you could tell that, uh, you know, this is Martin Birch's song, in my opinion, anyway. His mix in it, is his ultimate signature that would that would accompany every maiden album until until they got yeah <laughs> you know you know you know stefan uh, from a vocal perspective i could tell you i've talked to paul many many times on air and off air and i've always asked him a million questions and i drove him crazy and i could tell you when you went into recording this album you told me it was very very nervous the standards were here now. These This band was growing, is getting popular. And then they come in with these sort of more complicated songs than the first album. He was nervous. He, Martin Birch worked him hard in the studio, but he was happy that he did because he took that sort of what he learned in the studio and he used it, you know, in, in future on future projects. So that's a little bit tidbit from Paul. Rest in peace. Um, we're going to go to side two now. My Lord, oh my God, oh my God, Side Two Killers might be my favorite track ever in Iron Maiden, period. No, it's not Number the Beast, it's Killers. This is the perfect metal song. It was one of the newer songs that was written. The lyrics, if you listen to Iron Maiden Live at the Rainbow, there was alternate lyrics that Paul was scribbling down before he did the show. And then I think him and Steve kind of worked on these real lyrics. But Melissa, go ahead. Yep. Absolutely. Quintessential. I think that this is very much this um, the signature Iron Maiden song, if you ask me. And I think that this is the song for me that kind of embodies Paul, Paul's vibe, yes. Paul's stage presence, just his delivery. This, 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 this song just embodies him and his persona for me. I, I, yeah, this song is, this is one of the best songs in all metal, not just Iron Maiden. <laughs> and it also, it, it also shows <clears throat> that you can have an incredibly addictive metal tracks that is not necessarily the fastest track. Yes. And, you know, it had a very, very deep groove, and I find it unfortunate that it's no longer on the set list because uh, for me, it's the song that best defines this album. Yeah, and yeah. Funny exactly. enough, that's what it's called. <laughs> Killer. <laughs> uh, but without that song, this album would have suffered tremendously and might not be 
the classic it is now because right. it was a really, really central work, a central painting within this uh, fantastic collection of songs. It's got the same sort of intro as Ides of March into Wrathchild. It's got that same sort of buildup and Paul delivers it, you know, with those screams at the beginning and the brutality, the brutality of his voice and the brutality of the production. This, and we're talking about 1981 here, right? It still stands the test of time next to any of those metal bands that come out with those brutal albums. It has definitely, it's, it's a, you put it on today, you go, this, there's no, there's no argument. Is this a no. metal song or not? This is a metal song. No. I don't know anybody who doesn't like this song. I mean, this song is is quintessential, quintessential Iron Maiden. Yeah, it's it's clever lyric wise too because it talks about the the victim. It goes to the killer, goes back to the victim, and then it goes back to the killer, right? Who is 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 hunting down their victim? So there you go, there you go, there you go. All right, Twilight Zone, which was not on the original release in the UK, North America. They put it on. This was a newer track that they kind of like shoved in um it was a dave murray track i believe and harris a li very very it was a single too right well, go ahead melissa i like the song i don't love the song i mean it's sort of like uh, i didn't have it when i first because i had the import so my import didn't have it and then i got i got the u.s version and it had it and it was it was it was fine it was a nice addition it wasn't like oh my god Thank God they batted this. It was like, oh, it's a nice addition. All right. I uh, go ahead. I, I find a Twilight Zone. Um, you could tell the band on that song were sort of. It was a bit off in the sense that it's not their regular sound. They were trying something else. I don't know if it maybe because it was a Dave song and Dave had other ideas, but. You know, uh, it's it stood the test of time, yeah. uh, and it's again you have to look at every song as part of a very precise, complete package. Yeah, it's part of the journey. It's absolutely part uh, of the journey, uh, guys. For me, this is like one of my favorite songs off the album. Really? I just love the try to sing that song. Go in the shower, put that song, on, and try to sing that song. The vocal phrasing. Is, is, is so difficult from the chorus to the verse, and it's only two minutes and 33 seconds. So what they jam in, you don't, you don't, when you're listening to this song, you don't realize how short it is, but there's so much compounded in that song in terms of guitar work and that vocal delivery by Paul. That's where Paul shines as a vocalist. You could say, you know what, Paul's, Paul's a really good vocalist, and Martin Birch really worked him hard in, in that control room to, uh, or that vocal booth to get it down. Paul says, I've asked Paul about this, and he goes, Jimmy, I had to practice and practice and practice and practice to get that phrasing right until we recorded that. It's a tough song to sing, but uh, I love it. To me, it's one of my favorite tracks. I don't think they've, when's the last time they even played that song live? Bruce must have played it like years ago. I, and I think that it's, a, um, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I think it's a, kind of like a, a bridge track, right? You can kind of see where they were kind of going. Yeah. Yeah, where they were yeah, headed, yeah. where they had been, and where they were headed. It's sort of a middle bridge where they're kind of like you can you can well, see Melissa, that, that you can see that that's a newer track that 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 wasn't yes, something from nineteen seventy seven. Yes. You can sort of see what direction the band is going in. Yeah, yeah. And we go Prodigal Son. Now this is like, wait a second, what's going on here? <laughs> acoustic guitars. Wow, Dance of Death was the last time they had acoustic guitars since right uh, in the future. That is. What is going on here, Melissa? Acoustic I guitars, absolutely it's... love this song. This is one of my favorite songs. And it's one of my favorite so vocal deliveries by Paul. This and Remember Tomorrow, I think that it shows yeah. that he can sing, shows the softer side of him and the more vulnerable side of him. And I just, I absolutely love this song. I I, I know a lot of people say, oh, it's, you know, it's too slow. And it, and it kind of like slowed down the momentum of the album. But I sort of disagree. I think it's a nice little, I don't know if you want to call it a cool down or whatever, a nice little relax and and uh, enjoy this lovely song. I think it's a beautiful song. I think it's a beautiful song too. It's about Lamia, the classical uh, female demon who devoured children. 
yep. from Greek mythology. And if you listen to the, and this reminds me of Paul and his, his passing, the devil's got a hold of my soul. He's driving me mad. That's like one of the last lines. It's so Paul, but go ahead, Stefan. It's, it's a very well-written song, uh, wise and, and, and beautiful words and intelligent words, but it's not my favorite. Uh, I have to be honest. I don't. I think it would have worked better as a B-side to a single than an album track. Okay. But look, I understand why they put it there. Uh, the band was still experimenting. First album had "Remember Tomorrow." Second album has this one. You know, maybe because I grew up so passionate about listening to this record and letting the anger out of my body every time I turn it up with my headphones because my parents couldn't tolerate this sort of music. And then, why do I need this track? Let's switch to Purgatory, you know? <laughs> Not me, Stefan. I don't either, but... To me, to yeah, me, but a lot, of, a lot of people... Jimmy, a lot of people, I hear that from a lot of people. A lot of people say, yeah, this is my bathroom break. This is my skip. This is my, you know... I go put the stuff in the dryer. You know, you know where Paul excelled? He can be brash. He can be harsh. But man, can he sing a slow song. Yeah, Much and he better than Bruce. Side. Bruce is more operatic. He couldn't deliver a song, a nice, beautiful piece like Paul did. He just couldn't. He didn't have the voice for it. He doesn't have the voice for it. Not to say Bruce can't sing. Bruce is an incredible singer. Different tone, different range. But Paul really can deliver a slow track like Remember Tomorrow, you know? And, 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 and this song, too, Prodigal Son, beautiful song, beautiful song. Um, and the acoustic guitars work and his delivery works. And uh, the, last rhyme, the last line reminds me of Paul. All right, let's go to Stefan's Purgatory. <laughs> what a great song. <laughs> what a great song. What a great song is right. Let's oh, go man, go the, 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 the okay. chorus. The I love line. everything about this song. It's just a rocking tune. Uh, everything about this song is awesome. Um, I think it's sort of like it, it does to Killers what Prowler did to the first album. You know, this strong, memorable uh, song sing along. with a solid sing along to it, with very well structured. And in this case, when he sings the chorus and his. And, and Diano takes his voice to the next level with the oh, oh, oh. I, I was just like, my God, just looking at him, you'd never think he can sing that high. And and, and that song does it. Um, I, it's very addictive. Uh, I believe it was part of the Killers set during that tour. I was always disappointed that it never reappeared after that. But uh, one of my favorite songs of the album. I think they played on the Beast on on the Road tour, but I, maybe I got to check that out. Melissa, what did you think about Purgatory? I love Purgatory. As I as I said, I think it's just a great song. I think it's a banger song. I think it's a sing alongy song. Yeah, this is, it's fun. It's fun. It was fun live. It's just a fun song. It's a great song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what? Again, there is a little bit of the repetitive lyrics. Yeah, That's there is the that. But, but yeah. you know, that kind of makes it sort of sing-alongy, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, you know, you know and, I, and I, when I was in Martin Popoff's book talking about killers, I used to say that there is a subconscious theme throughout this album. There's a lot of killing and death and, and you know, demons mm. eating children and uh, murders and exiles of innocent exiles. So there's a lot of purgatories and, and suicide and another life and all that stuff. Yeah. So there's a lot of death. But maybe Iron Man's always had those topics they have they've always been topics. sort of um sullen in that respect in their in their lyrics and in, in in what they write about they've always been kind of you know metal is not really supposed to be happy right the song was originally called floating it was recorded or re written in 1977 again part of the batch of tracks that they recorded back in the day before paul diano all right uh, let's go to the last track of the album drifta drifta oh. So, I, this is one of my favorite okay, songs on the album. Actually, this is actually one of my favorite songs on the album. I absolutely love this song. It's a banger. It's great. 
Um, I love the guitar. I love the guitar solo in the song. I love everything about this song. It's, this is one of my favorite tracks on the album. Yeah. And this is a great. This is a great closer. I mean, it, it gets you. It gets you off on a on a high. You know what I mean? It didn't. It didn't. They didn't close with Prodigal Son or something like that. They closed it out where you're just like, you know, you're. In, I don't know what the word is. You just you're really enjoying it. You're really into it or whatever, you know. And the only sad thing about it is after Drifter Drifter is over, it's like, oh no, it's the album's over. You know? <laughs> it kind of leaves you wanting more. <laughs> you know, Stefan, before you say what you want to say, this is the only song lyric wise that's not about killing and death and massacre and all that. <laughs> it's about cuddling up with you tonight. I'm gonna cuddle up to you tonight. Go ahead, Stefan. Drifter. Um, first of all, those opening lines, and then the bass kicking in and, and bringing it to another level. Uh, for me, it's, mm -hmm. it's one of their most memorable songs. One of their most popular in the early years. It was often a closing song, a closing song live. And this is where Diano got his, uh, audience participation. Uh, yo, 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 yo. Yo. And uh, I think, I don't know if it was on Made in Japan, was it? Live uh, Plus One. Live, Live plus, plus One, one. thank you. Yeah. Forgot yeah. about that one. And and I kept playing it, and, and my friend and I, with our cheap car stereo, we would, you know, run the cassette super loud, would stop in traffic at a red light, and yo, yo, yo. <laughs> Stefan's trying I to find the it. book, the English book of Yodi Yodi Yo. What does that mean in English? What does that mean in English? Well, back then, <laughs> uh, I was told that Paul Diano had a uh, taste for reggae music, where that type of, you know, singing was kind of common if you listen to Bob Marley albums of the era. Yeah. So, uh, Look, he was, he was thought, a reggae. He, he he got it from the police. It was yeah. actually from the police that at the time in 77, 78, there was a lot of yo You're right. You're yeah. right. And yeah, yeah. yeah These are the things he told me on the side, but yeah, yeah, that's it's kind of but a, look, a little tip. Uh I think show me a, a heavy metal musician who says he's never listened to pop and doesn't care about pop, and I, I won't believe him. You know, <laughs> whether you go to a party a friend's party you will always have pop you know a bar mitzvah you name it there's pop and uh look audience participation songs after a while i sort of like meh okay get every section of the arena to sing one after the other oh who's the, the, loudest? Side, the right yeah, side the loudest the loudest the middle. Oh, let's hear you from the back and let's hear from the balcony uh shut up and play another song but Again, Maiden did not overdo this. No. Uh, they did not overdo it. You know, I was a power wolf the other day, and I thought, like, no, shut up. Play more songs instead. Maiden did not do that. They knew how to please the audience without turning into um, some cheesy, uh, cliche tricks to keep the audience going. But Killer, uh, but uh, I mean, a Drifter was so powerful that you wanted to participate because you did not want the song to end. Exactly. And that's how good it was. That's how right. good it remains. And I truly wish, uh, you know, I, I never had a chance to see Paul Diano solo. Uh, but had he lived... I would have looked forward to hearing that song. <laughs> Are you there? Tom is back. Is he frozen? Tom, can you move? I can move. Can you hear me? You came in for the second part of the show, and we're going to talk about... <laughs> Until I freeze the up killers, again. The, and we'll let you start this time. So okay. If you freeze up, we could just knock it right off. Yeah. Tom, okay, before so we get... Before we get... you got to hurry up, Stefani. You might freeze. <laughs> God, I'm want, sorry. I want Tom to give us a quick hmm. internal impression of Killers as a whole. Uh, very good. I love it. Um, uh, 
the only if there is such a thing of filler there to me there's not filler on the album it would be genghis khan the um oh, instrumental oh, la, la. um Stefan, look but i i still like that though so what i about another life do you think that's a filler song too no i love that song oh <laughs> i love i like we don't see song. eye to eye no i said the same thing i said i love every song on the album too i do i i do and because that's that was you know when i that's my first you know i had the first album of course yeah. so that's that's what iron made and that's how i started with the very first album all three of you have seen iron maiden on the killers 81 tour in different cities tom it was in milwaukee yeah montreal toronto and milwaukee and maybe in la somewhere they headlined they did not open up for Priest. So tell us about that experience, Tom. Well, I, I saw them at, it was, it's a music festival that Milwaukee has every year um, called Summerfest. But they, Maiden, were alone. They were by themselves. They didn't have an opening band. It was just them. It was actually, um, interestingly enough, a radio station, a rock radio station, uh, rock radio station in milwaukee was simulcasting that the show over their airwaves so it was a full show and it was at what they called the rock stage back because there was multiple stages but that it was made by themselves so it was an hour 15 hour 20 minutes that they played as a matter of fact the they played every song off of killers but one and that was I got to look on this. Prodigal Son. Correct. Because they've never played Prodigal Son live. That was it. That was the only song they did not play off of Killers. Um, so there were several thousand people there. To my surprise, but you've got a built-in probably 80,000 people that go to this thing every day. Because yeah. there's all kinds of different stages, but Maiden was all there. You know, So it's a festival, there. but it's just one band every day for a week. That's what you're trying to say. It's no, you had bands playing simultaneously on other stages. It's down on Milwaukee's lakefront, so it's a huge, huge space of land. Okay. And, all right. All right. But um, it was just them. So I got to see a headlining show. No, I don't think, as you mentioned earlier, probably they, they didn't. And and what they, was your and, and after they performed, what was your takeaway? Like, oh like, man, how, it was we great. went home saying this is my favorite band in the world, or. It was, me or, it was just great because, you know, Paul, of course, sang and um, I just had Killers came out maybe four months right before that, that I saw them. I think Steph, I think I saw them like four days after you did. Right. I think yeah, it was the yeah. 26th of June in 81 is when I saw them. Yeah. Summerfest was 26th of June. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Montreal, Le Club Montréal was on june 22nd so yeah. four days earlier so there, there were there were people all the way back as far as it would allow and there's several thousand that you can fit into that area so it was like i was very pleasantly surprised and the crowd they knew who maiden was paul at one point early in the show said hi we are iron maiden and if you don't know who we are, we're from the east end of London or something along those lines. Um, and there's actually a YouTube that you can search of that show. I have it. Oh. And uh, it's pretty cool. Anybody can just Google Milwaukee Summerfest Iron Maiden 1981. It's just a very rough. Um, it's basically a tape of what played on the radio. It's the entire show. So um, you, you it was... What, I, I was too young. I was 13. So yeah. So yeah. In, eight, in 81, I graduated high school. So I was, uh, I turned 18. So I was 18 actually when the show yeah, went down. Yeah. So I'm like into Maiden and I just, and Paul, he, he just, he had an aggress, aggression to him. You know, he was at the time I thought, well, he's, he's got short hair and then we all knew he had short hair. You know, he was the only guy with short hair in the band and you know, the black leather jacket he had on, I believe that night. It's just, he, he was, like in, a in opinion, they were just a little heavier. You know, they came across heavier than they morphed into. Um, I think uh, Number of the Beast was still in that heavier manner. Mm -hmm. um, but he was great. He was, he was not like 
when Bruce was young, you know, he, he was running all over the damn stage. But Paul was not a runner, but he would work the crowd really well. And he, he just had a power feel to him. And um, he, I think the crowd responded quite well to him. But it was the just golden great. years. The golden years. It was time. just amazing because they were heavy and they were great. Now, now, keep in mind, this is a young Iron Maiden, a hungry band in, in Milwaukee. They had a chance to play a headlining show. They're going to go, you know, full on out. And not to say they would, you know, just cash it in or just mail it in at other shows, but it gave them a chance. And it, it, I was thinking, how the hell do they know all the songs how to play? Because they were opening for Priest. So <laughs> I don't think they had a lot of rehearsal for a full set. But Strange enough, cool. they, were, they were playing with Priest. The Most of the dates in North America were with Priest, opening right, for Priest. Right, right. And they veered off and did a few shows, mm -hmm. and they went back on the Priest tour, right? And I guess, you know, kudos to the management that, you know, sought it out, or I don't know who contacted who, because this is organized. I mean, it was on the radio. And there was, you know, some that day, you know, they're talking about, yeah, tonight we're going to have Iron Maiden live from Summerfest. Like, holy shit. It was really great. So it, it's right. a very unique Tom, situation. Pause right there before you freeze. I think you're starting yeah. to freeze again. Oh, <laughs> At least you got it all in. cut me off. At least yeah, you got it all in. All right. <laughs> Alyssa, tell me, tell me about Boston. It wasn't at the gardens. What is it? So it wasn't. It was at the Orpheum Theater, which is still still around. The weird thing about the Orpheum Theater is it's like there's seats. So there isn't really anywhere to, it's not like a, there's no standing area. It's not like a, going to a club or whatever. But it was an all ages show, obviously. Um, I was with my friends. They did not, a lot of my friends did not want to go in because they didn't really know Iron Maiden or they knew one or two songs and they didn't, you know, they want to stay outside and get high and, you know, whatever. But I wanted to go in because I knew who they were and I loved them and I wanted to go and I was very excited and I was, um, my seats, I had sort of seats because everybody had seats. Uh, first row balcony, went in with a couple of friends of mine and saw the show. And I was just, I loved them. They were, um, they were kind of like, kind of punky, right? Um, Steve would be mad if he heard me say that. But that's how Paul's vibe was. He did have the short hair and the leather jacket. And he didn't really look metal. He looked more like a punk, a punk guy. Um, but he definitely had the attitude and um, he definitely did know how to work the crowd and his voice sounded great. His voice live is a little bit raspier than it is on the, it, like if you, if you hear like um, some of the stuff on YouTube, you can see, you can, you can tell that his voice is a little bit raspier live, you know, it's not as cleaned up or whatever. He still could sing great. Um, obviously they didn't do a whole hour and a half because they're opening for a priest on the point of entry tour. Um, then, but they did, you know, a mix of the two, um, two albums. They ended with Iron Maiden. Um, they played Sanctuary and Wrathchild and, um, they opened with Ides of March. And, um, and, and I just, it, after that, I was like, these are, these, this, these are my, these, this, these are my people. This is my band. <laughs> yeah. 40 plus years St later. Stefan, all right. Well, it's a little bit different in Montreal and Toronto. They actually, it was a big deal, man. They headlined in Montreal. I would think, what is it? The club was, uh, was, was a theater size. What is it, like 700? I can't remember. Yeah. I uh, Look, before I get into the show itself, I'm going to tell you the type of week I had. Okay. And, and, uh, and those You're not days. going to give us the news or anything. <laughs> I, <laughs> I was 14. I was about a few weeks short of my 15th birthday. Uh, but I was lucky enough to be a very tall guy, even back then. So, and the Club Montréal is a club. You had to be over 18. And so, those days, I never went out with my, without my uh, brother's IDs. Uh, and he would laugh and say, sure, you can take my IDs, you know, and go wherever you want. Wouldn't ask my parents, but they suspected so that week, Iron Maiden was my fifth fifth concert in one week. Wow, that's a good week. That's okay. a really good week. And I was 14. I the was first thinking. two, uh, 14, again, fake IDs, Anvil, 
was the house band at the Mustache Club. <laughs> they were playing every night. Uh, and I went to two of those nights. School finished at around that time. And while all my friends were partying and getting drunk, I was the nerdy guy with glasses. I, I would sneak into the mustache and enjoy three sets of Anvil two nights in a row. And then I had a night off on St. Jean Baptiste Day or national holiday. And then two nights in a row at the Club Montréal Girl School. I had tickets for the first show, and I thought they were so kick-ass that I went back the second night with $5. It was cheap. And then Maiden was a bit more expensive. Ugh, $8.50. Man, am I ever going to be able to scrape that with my paper route? <laughs> and and I went to the Club Montréal. Amazingly, it was not sold out. In fact, you had less of a crowd than girl school did. And everybody there was essentially a customer from Rock on Stock, that heavy metal record store. So I knew half the people there to start with. And the electricity in the air was incredible because girl school was playing on radio. Anvil had some radio airplay because it was Canadian content and, you know, whatever you can put on the air that's Canadian would help the radio stations. But Maiden was off the radar. No write-up in the newspapers, no, nothing on the radio. Uh, it was before, of course, MTV, Music Plus, Much Music and all of that. So to be at Iron Maiden at Le Club Montréal, where they're not opening for anyone, it was a show for connoisseur. If you did oh, not know I'm them, connoisseurs. If you did not know them, what were you doing there? And I knew Killers by heart back then. I knew most of the first album by heart. Uh, I arrived very early. I sneaked it uh, right to the front. I was leaning my two arms in the middle of the stage. And I seen a picture taken from further back where you actually see the back of my head. I'd recognize <laughs> it. And I'm there like going batshit crazy. They had this horrific, horrific opening band so Maiden gets on stage and I'm just like screaming crazy. Uh, you know, th there's the introduction, Ides of March. The only person on stage was Clive, who was, you know, already behind a set of drums. And then there was a roadie with the Eddie mask. Oh, the Eddie mask, I forgot that. Who was, yeah. you know, getting the crowd going and fist in the air. And the people like were eating it uh, like crazy uh i don't remember the the song specifically but in right in front of me i have the set list uh, fm if hopefully accurate um so they opened with i always thought they opened with rat child but it seems they opened sanctuary. with sanctuary into purgatory rat child remember tomorrow another life Genghis khan Killers, Innocent Exile, Twilight Zone, Murders in the Rue Morgue, Phantom of the Opera, Iron Maiden, and then the encore was Running Free, Transylvania with Dave's guitar solo, and Drifter. Yo, yo, yo. Anyway, <laughs> the, the whole thing was just like, he was like right at my, in front of my face. And... What was amazing about Diano is that he walked on stage from the back of Clive, all clad in leather, and he looked like a punk rocker, while the other ones looked like metalheads with long hair. And he comes in and he had dark glasses, shades, and he just walked grabs the microphone and starts singing it was incredible 
couple of things I remember. Uh, he high-fived a lot of people on the front row, including me. I remember once he lit a cigarette, took a couple of puff, and passed it on to me. I was not a smoker, but I took a puff. <laughs> Jordan right out. Next to me. Uh, he did that with his uh, glass of uh, vodka orange juice, took a few sips, and looked at people in front of him who wanted. I grabbed it, took a sip. I wasn't drinking alcohol back then and gave it to the guy next to me. And he was really, really compelling. And then the craziest thing was uh, Steve Harris. He, you could tell that the guy was such a consumed professional that he wanted every one of those 700 people in the club to get going. He was not looking at people up front like like uh, Paul was. He was looking at the entire audience. He fixated the, 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 the passion in his eyes, the sweat that was splashing in front of me and everybody else. Uh, it was like a demon in his eyes. And I remember uh, Dave and uh, Adrian, they were not yet close playing next to each other. Uh, in fact, Adrian was a bit more distant than the other ones. Dave was like a total madman. I remember at the end of the show, he smashed his guitar on stage. He didn't break it, but just smashing. And you could tell Paul was looking at him and says, you, go easy. We have a show tomorrow. We can't <laughs> afford new guitars every night. Uh, and it was just a mad uh, tank rolling through the fields with this most powerful music and I walked out of there I remember there was the four of us, there was me uh, there was Michel, the owner of Rock on Stock, there was this guy Alain uh, Jardel I still keep in touch with him to this day and this other guy uh, Pascal, the four of us and Eve, another friend of us, the five of us were leaving the, the venue and we said no what was this this is incredible and we chatted went to restaurants and and and, and talked about this show for hours and hours and that was it all of us were lifelong fans from that day on you, you know stefan everything you said is the reason why paul diano is loved globally and for his legacy will live on because Without him, the band, you could talk about Steve Harris's writing, of course, this, this combination of this unit of, of, of the right musicians at the right time with the right voice and the right attitude, it just took off, man. It was just something that no one's ever heard of before. And uh, that's a testament to, uh, to Paul and his legacy. And I'm happy we all got to share. Like, I'm happy you guys got to share you know, your, your experiences there. And uh, a nice tribute to Paul, uh, you know, uh, rest in peace. And uh, that's about it, guys. Great loss. And yes. I'm really happy that Bruce took the time the other night to pay tribute to him because uh, the first two Maiden albums remain my favorite. Yeah, me too. They remain my go-to records. Uh, and the following year, during the Number of the Beast tour... I said, Bruce is great, but he cannot make me forget Paul. Yeah. It, took a, it took at least until the uh, Peace of Mind tour where I thought, okay, yeah, yeah, Bruce is, is a different guy and he's taking the band to a different direction. And, you know, and, and I love Bruce's era too, but yeah. we'll never forget that what Paul did. Unless yeah, I mean, I think the thing, remarks. the thing is, is that. Um, I think that it's not lost on Bruce or anybody else in that band that if those two albums did not go well, there would not be any Iron Maiden today. There would have been no number of the beast if um if if things hadn't gone as well as they did on those first two albums, and that Paul was part of that was part of contributing to making those two albums a success. So I mean, they they are um, continuing on his legacy. Um, that that he he that he helped build this band. He helped build this band. 
that yes went on to great things and and yes they went on without him and so on and so on. But there's whenever you have a house, you have a foundation, and the foundation has to be solid. And the first two albums are a testament to a solid foundation that they were able to build a house on top of. Yeah, well said. Uh, the, and it, and this is my last note. Killers, even though when it was released, there was no big hit single like I mentioned before. But this album, over time, has gotten bigger and bigger. And if you see, because I remember when I was you know young lad like you guys were, it wasn't as popular with the mainstream because it was not a very mainstream-ish album. But today, I'm telling you, it's at least, when I do these polls, it always comes in like three or two or four. It's always hovering in the top five mm -hmm. as one of Maiden's best albums ever. I know a lot of people that it's their, it's their number one album. When I talk to artists, you could talk to Scott Ian. I was just talking to uh, Tom Hunting from uh, Exodus. All these guys and many, many more have have cited, you know, Killers as Killers as one of their, you know, in, most influential albums Absolutely. when they were growing up. Maybe because they're the same age group as us, but yeah. that's what turned them on to metal and to become musicians. Guys, it's been wonderful, great chat. Thank you, Tom, wherever you are.